are. There we are. Good morning to those of you on the line on uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, so a few weeks back, I mentioned that it doesn't happen very often that I can continue on in a series like the one we're on right now regarding the Word of God and still talk about the upcoming holiday. And so I was able to do that, tie the two in together, and here we are now, exactly one week from Christmas Day, and I can still stick with the series on the Word of God. I'm going to be preaching from John, but notice on your outline, uh, verses I have there for you in Hebrews, from Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews 1, verse, uh, verse 1 and the first part of verse 2, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Interesting verses. God in, in the past spoke unto our fathers, and of course the writer of Hebrews, uh, unnamed, was uh, obviously a Jewish background, and he's saying, uh, our ancestors, our Jewish ancestry, God spoke to them through the prophets. But now, God, in, in these last days, and of course uh, the last days have been 2,000 years now, but in these last days, God spoke to us, not through prophets, and not through angels, but God spoke to us through his Son. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, God's greatest revelation of himself. Some would, would argue even greater than his written word is God incarnate, when God came in the flesh. Take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, uh, if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 778, 778, John chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 14, a kind of a non-traditional uh, Christmas passage, but very much a Christmas passage nonetheless. Uh, Look at uh, John 1, verse beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth. What was God's message to us through his son? That is what we're going to be looking at, at least part of that. That message through his son is uh, uh, large, obviously. But we want to consider what, who the word is, what John saw, what was the message that we learn uh, from John's description of the Word becoming flesh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for watching over each and every one that's here this morning, uh, keeping us safe on the roads. Uh, we thank you for a warm church building with the power on. Uh, we thank you that we can gather as your people and enjoy singing these special hymns of praise to you as we think of the Christmas season. And we thank you for your precious word that teaches us the significance of Christ's coming to earth. Uh, we thank you that you came in the person
person of Christ to take our place on the cross. Uh, we, we love uh, the manger and, and the, the lights and the songs. And yet, uh, the true message is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And uh, we thank you that he did that. And Lord, I thank you that you know the need of each heart here this morning, those uh, right here in the auditorium, and those that will listen online later, and those that are listening now. And uh, we thank you that you can take your word and you can use it to, to speak to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would want to be spoken to, uh, that we would hear, not just with our ears, but uh, with our hearts, that we would obey you. And again, we just thank you for your grace in giving us Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Number, first thing before we actually get into the outline, I, I, I want to say right out of the gate that uh, the passage that I read is probably one of the most doctrinally rich passages in the whole Bible. And no matter uh, how long you, you study a passage like this and you think about it, you meditate on it, you read on it, you pray over it, uh, we still, I'm still reminded that our finite hearts and our limited understanding really can't grasp everything that's involved in these verses. And it, it reminds me of Romans 11, 33, and I think I gave you that verse. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We, there, there is so much here, and it's hard for us to get it all. Closely tied to that is the fact that I can't possibly share with you everything that's in this passage. Uh, I have to leave some out. And here's what I want you to do, because some of you have minds like mine, okay? When I was there, I used to think, well, why didn't he say this? Why didn't he say that? Why? You know, if you have a mind like that, just shut it off and don't focus on what I'm not sharing, focus on what I am sharing. Sharing, all right. Number one, number one, the meaning of the word, the meaning of the word, verse 14, and the word was made flesh. What, or better, who is the word? And the answer that most, if not all of you already know, is the word is Jesus. And so we could say, and Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and go on. But the description that John makes of the word here in this passage is just way too rich to say it's Jesus and move on. Maybe we'll do that next week. Uh, but notice verse number one. Verse number one. In the beginning. We got a little buzzing going on. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, now we got some... Uh, uh, um, in the beginning, ever hear, hear those words before? Right? That's how the Bible starts. In the beginning. In the beginning, Genesis 1 1, what's the next word? In the beginning, what? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John starts the same way. In the beginning, Again, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Anything about creation there? In the beginning, God created? No. Uh, verse number 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Uh, no mention of creation there. Verse number 3, we have a mention. In fact, the whole verse is about creation. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I, I had this thought. As I was studying, really kind of digging into this, um, it seems like God, and this is just my thought, uh, it seems like God through John, think Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God, and then it's like, God, through John, is making sure we get 
so a little more information about the God that created. It's almost like he's given a commentary on in the beginning God created. And, uh, you know, maybe I didn't explain that very well, but I, I have it for you on your, on your outline there. In the beginning, God, parentheses, the word that was with God and was God, John 1, 1 and 2, and later made flesh, created the heaven and the earth. Again, that's just a thought I had. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Um, can't say for sure that's what John intended was to expand on Genesis 1-1. They start to say, in the beginning, God. Uh, in the beginning, and then John expands on who is God. So here's, notice the progression of thought. First, the Word was there at the beginning of creation. In the beginning of creation, the Word was already there. Secondly, the Word was with God. It says that. The third, the mystery is cleared up. The Word was God. So everything the Word was, God was. Everything God was, the Word was and is. And then we know from verse number three that the Word was the Creator. Still talking about the Word in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, still talking about the Word. The Word was Creator. All things were made by Him, the Word, and without Him, the Word was not anything made that was made. Question for you. Not a trick question. Did the Word, according to verse 3, create all things? The answer is yes. Again, verse 3, not a trick question. Was anything made, was anything created that was not created by the Word? No. The Word created everything. Nothing was created without the Word. Now here's one more question. Maybe it, it might sound like a trick question, but it isn't. Okay? How many creators can create all things? Only one, right? Only one creator can create all things. And since the Word created all things, no one else can make that claim. There can't be two creators of all things. One did not it's not possible. Only one creator could create all things. Pastor, where are you going with this? You'll find out. Um, on your outline, Colossians 1, verse 16. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Who is the him? If we were to go back to Colossians 1 and read the verses before and afterwards, we would certainly quickly realize that it's talking about Christ. So Christ created all things. All things were created by him. All things were created for him. So how can the Word be the creator of all things and Jesus be the creator of all things? Same. They're the same, one and the same. And that is the point that God wants us to make sure that we get. They are two names for the same being. And so... God wants us to have firm in our mind that the Word equals God equals the Father equals the Creator. Three and one. Can I explain three and one? No. Can you? No. That's all right. I want God to be bigger than me and unexplainable. I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that. But, and, and I've mentioned this numerous times, but I think it's good for us to have straight in our minds God did not send Jesus to come to earth to do something God didn't want to do. Okay? 
God putting his dirty work on his son. No, God came to earth in the form of Jesus to die for us. And there, there is a difference, a, a distinction that we need to make sure that we have. Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, I already gave you those verses, but they, uh, one part of verse 2 there says, by whom also he made the world, speaking of the Son. So the Word is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Creator. Back to verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I'm calling that number two. Number two on your outline, the marvel of the Word. The marvel of the Word. God became man. Letter A. The Word was made flesh. And again, uh, lots of theological truth in here to try and un- Mine, uh, mine out, I'm not, I, I just want to give you a few things to, to think about. I'm sure some of them you've thought of before, I've mentioned some in the past. But three truths regarding the enfleshment, or what we call the incarnation of the Word. So sub-point number one there, Jesus was made flesh before he was born. Okay, let me explain that. Jesus was made flesh before he was born. I'm being technical, okay? But Jesus was human inside the womb, right? His birth didn't make him a human, kind of like people now. It's not a baby till it's born, so you can kill it inside because it's not a human. How does that work? It doesn't work. It's wrong. It always has been. A human is a human when they are conceived. And Jesus did not become man when Mary hugged him. I don't think Joseph slapped him. I think, you know, when Mary hugged him, Jesus was a man in, he was 100% man and 100% God at the same time in Mary's womb, okay? When he was conceived roughly nine months before he was born, just like us, he was 100% human. So point number two, again, listen carefully. I'm being technical, but Jesus was not miraculously born. Jesus was not miraculously born. The birth was not miraculous, okay? Again, I'm being technical, and I don't want to get too graphic, but Jesus was carried in Mary's stomach and came out the same way you and I did, okay? He, it, it was not a miraculous birth. The miracle was in his conception, how he was created, how he put on flesh. I guess I should be more technical, but Mary gave birth to God in the flesh the same way she gave birth to four other boys that are mentioned by name in Matthew 13. Uh, 35, I, did, I believe it is, Matthew 13, 35, four boys are named, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And then in verse Matthew 13, 56, sisters, plural, are mentioned. And so Mary had more than one child, and Jesus' birth was normal childbirth. But the miracle was in his conception. Jesus became man without the involvement of a man. There was no physical intimacy on the part of a man. Uh, on your outline, I have a couple of those verses that prove that, Matthew 1, 20. But while he, Joseph, thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, your wife-to-be, your betrothed wife, has not been with another man. She has not been unfaithful. Yes, she is pregnant, but not through the act of man, through an act of God. Look at uh, Luke 1, again on your outline, 31, and then verses 34 and 35. Uh, angel talking to her, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Then 
said Mary unto the angel, a very logical question, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man, I have not had a close relationship, intimate relationship. The angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be called, or shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Some of you might be thinking, okay, pastor, explain this to us. To which I reply, I can't. Okay, I can't. It was a miracle of God, and I accept it by faith. But I will say this. God created the first Adam from the dust of the ground without man or woman. He certainly can take this, can, can in flesh the second Adam uh, without the help of a man. And so we take it by faith. Number three, sub-point number three, and again, these are just some things to, to think about, have straight in our minds, I think is important. Number three, Jesus did not get his humanity from Mary. Jesus did not get his humanity from Mary. And many suggest that. Many say, well, Jesus got his God part from the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was involved, and Jesus got his man part from Mary. But if you think about that, if you think that through, what you're implying is that, well, Jesus wasn't God, and he needed his divineness, he needed his divinity given to him, and so he got that from the Holy Spirit. It's like, wait a minute, if Jesus, Jesus always has been God, Jesus didn't need the Holy Spirit to give him his divine nature. He already had a divine nature. And so Jesus did not get his humanness from Mary. He got his humanness from God, the Holy Spirit. Pastor, that's kind of technical, but think about it. If he had to be given his deity, then he wasn't God to begin with. He didn't have to get his deity. He had to get what he had to take on was flesh, and that was the miracle of the Holy Spirit in giving him a body, making him man. Again, I can't necessarily uh, explain it, but I believe it is so. And God uh, certainly says Jesus always has been God. Let her be. The Word was made flesh. Let her be. The Word dwelt among us. The word dwelt among us. The word for dwelt is interesting. Uh, it literally means to have one's tent or to dwell. And so uh, Bruce puts it like this. F.F. Uh, Bruce says, uh, it's like Jesus pitched his, God through Jesus pitched his tabernacle with us. And so Bruce puts it like this. It is implied as God formally manifested his presence among his people in the tent which Moses pitched, now in a fuller sense, God has taken up residence on earth in the word that was made flesh. God was made flesh. He revealed himself to us by taking up residence on earth. And so John and others got to see what God in the flesh looked like, or what God in the flesh wanted to betray. They saw God tabernacling uh, with them, if I can use that word. So number three, the manifestation of the word. What did John see? How did God manifest himself? How did God portray himself? Verse number 14, the word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the Word's glory, Jesus' glory, we beheld, we saw, we looked at His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God revealed the glory of the Father in Christ but in a very different way than they probably were expecting. 
Uh, I, I, I'll say this again. I'll say it probably next week as we continue on in this message. Um, there are not two different gods. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They are not two different gods. They are the same God. But the picture that God's people had of God in the Old Testament uh, didn't make them recognize, well, okay, yeah, we see the likeness. They, they, they were kind of, they were looking for something different. So let's think about letter A on your outline, some of the Old Testament manifestations of God. God revealed himself in the Old Testament. Can't spend a lot of time on this, but think about in Exodus chapter 3, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush. What does God say? Draw not nigh hither, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Uh, in Exodus 19, again, you don't need to turn there. I, I think I have the verse for you there. But you think of Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, about to get the Ten Commandments from God and the instructions on how to build the tabernacle and a, a number of other things. In Exodus 19, 18, I love this verse. Exodus 19, verse 18, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. That's just a cool way to put it. Uh, altogether on a smoke. I, I just think that's, that's neat. Uh, but why? Because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. That was the picture of God that they had. Draw not nigh hither, the mountains shaking and smoking and fire. In Exodus 40, uh, the tabernacle was completed. It was dedicated, and God came in and filled, the, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses couldn't even go in. It was too bright. The, the essence of God was too great. Uh, take your Bibles, I want you to turn to Isaiah, book of Isaiah, middle of the Bible, go in the middle of the Bible, Psalms, a little bit after that is Isaiah, if you're using a pew Bible, it's page 518, Isaiah chapter 6, I want to look at Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah's experience, or when, when he met God, some of you are familiar with uh, with this passage, I've, I've preached on it uh, at least once. But Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, starting with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah writing, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train, his train is not a choo-choo that goes down the track that we have to wait for in town sometimes here. His train is the long flowing garment of majesty. Think of the, the bride with that thing that trails behind, right? Coming down the aisle, that's called the train, I think, if I remember right. Um, Abby? No. Um, so God, Isaiah sees God high, lifted up. Above, verse 2, stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, or with two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flied. And one cried unto another. Uh, continuously, I believe, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And here was Isaiah's response. Then said I, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He was, he, he recognized his sinfulness and his finiteness and his smallness when he got a picture of God. But John, when John beheld the Word, when John describes the Word, 
to us, Christ, uh, there was not the language of John, John didn't describe, draw not nigh hither. He didn't hear a voice. He didn't see a being that struck him with awe and fear. He saw, and he, he didn't see the Christ of Revelation chapter 1, where he fell on his feet as dead. Instead, he saw Christ. He saw the Father the, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. That's what he saw. He saw grace and truth. Did he mean that the glory of God is full of grace and truth? Or did he mean that Jesus is full of grace and truth? To which I reply, yes. Jesus was, Jesus is the glory of God. He is the expression of God. And Jesus was certainly on earth full of grace and truth. And so we're going to come back to this part uh, next week, grace and truth. Really dig into that. It's way too much to try and, and uh, cover in the little bit we have left. So we're going to kind of take a different direction. So the, the people familiar with the, the Old Testament, the Jews that were looking for Christ, they were looking for the Messiah, they had this picture of Moses on the mountain and Moses not drawing near the burning, burning bush and God filling the tabernacle uh, with glory, and Isaiah falling down as dead before God. Woe is me, I am as done, undone. So that, that's the picture they had, but the New Testament pictures of Jesus were very different. Letter B, the New Testament manifestations of God the Son. So what did people see, humanly speaking, when they looked upon Jesus? In other words, what did Jesus look like? The answer is, we don't know much. We do know a little. Number one on your outline, you might think, well, this is kind of lame, Pastor. But I think it's important based on some of our backgrounds. Some point number one, Jesus had no halo. Jesus didn't walk around on earth with a halo around his head. Okay? He didn't have this unusual glow about him that almost looks like a plate. I'm sorry, I'm not being disrespectful, but, um, you know, he, he didn't have this glow about him where everybody, like, you know, oh, we know who that is. We know who that is. Um, how do we know? Well, because there are numerous, and we're just going to look at a couple, there are numerous instances where a halo would have, could have, should have been pointed out if one was present. Okay? Jesus was 12. His family was in Jerusalem for a feast. They left Jerusalem. Mary, Joseph, other family, and they're getting ready to settle down for the night. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? They left Jesus in Jerusalem. They had to go back. They found him in the temple, and they were amazed at what they found because he is sitting with the doctors, he's sitting with the theologians, he's, he's sitting with the experts of the law, and they were amazed about what he asked and what he answered. They were amazed with what was going on inside of his head, not with, oh, this Kid with the halo is so amazing. No, it was more about what he was thinking, what he understood, what he knew. And here's a second one that confirms, I believe, that Jesus had no halo. Judas betrayed Jesus to the chief priests. He, he agreed to sell, to provide for a fee, the whereabouts of Jesus. He knew Jesus would be in the Garden of Gethsemane on a particular night. And so he brought this mob of soldiers and people with him. And he didn't say, he'll be easy to find. The only guy with the halo glowing at night is going to, it'll be a piece of cake. Uh, he didn't say that. He said, the one that I go up to and I kiss 
I greet, that's the one you need to take. And so the obvious implication is Jesus didn't have a halo that glowed in the dark, and he looked a lot like the other disciples, and that's why Judas had to make sure the right one is the one that I greet. <coughs> number two, some point number two on your outline. Jesus had no special features. Jesus had no special features. Uh, king Saul, the first king of Israel, was said to have been head and shoulders above everyone else. He was taller than everyone around him, giants accepted. King David, the Bible says, was of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. David was obviously handsome. The Bible doesn't say anything about Jesus being tall. The Bible doesn't say anything about Jesus being handsome. In fact, you're in Isaiah 6. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, uh, 548. You're using a few Bible. Isaiah 53, verse number 2. Talking about the context is Christ. As you go through it, you would, you would see that, and we will see that. But verse number 2, For he shall grow up before him, he, the Messiah, shall grow up before God as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Notice this. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Simply put, the human Jesus was not handsome. He was not, there was no beauty that we, it said that about David, said that about Saul, didn't say that about Jesus. There was nothing in Jesus' physical features that would attract us to him. He was not a handsome man. He was a plain looking Jewish man at that time. The other thing I could, could argue, we're not going to do that, uh, could take the time to, to prove is that I believe he had a beard. Isaiah 50 verse 6 talks about his beard being plucked out and so uh, Jewish men had beards at that time. It's not an uh, unusual thing. But if God was super concerned about outer looks, Jesus should have been the most handsome, buff, women put in all the adjectives you want, uh, kind of guy that there is out there, okay? But he wasn't. He looked just like the other disciples, and that's why Judas had to show which one he was. He was a common-looking Jewish man. And that's fitting because when Samuel was tasked by God, hey, Saul needs to be replaced as king, uh, part of God's instructions to Samuel was, don't look on the outward appearance. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And God demonstrated that in the physical features of Christ. They were nothing special. And of course, the specialness of God the Son is not in how he looked, it is in how he did. We're in Isaiah 53, and what he did, look at verse number 4. Specialness is in what Jesus did. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Jesus bore our griefs. Jesus carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And then verse number six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 6, 
is Christopher, you're right. Verse 6 is the message of Christmas. Verse 6 is a message of Christmas. We are like lost sheep that go astray. We have a nature that tugs us away from God. And it says, we have turned everyone to our own way. We have a sin nature that pulls us the wrong way. And then we also just flat out choose to go our own way. We choose to rebel. We choose to resist God. We choose to say, no, I will not have this person, this man, this being reign over me. That's our attitude. And so God's response, our response, would have been, all right. Go astray. Go your own way. Do your own thing. God's response was take our sin and put it on Christ. The Lord laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Our sin was put on Christ and Christ paid the penalty that we could not so that we could be forgiven. Does that happen automatically? Are we automatically forgiven? Jesus died once. Jesus doesn't die daily. Jesus isn't going to die again. Jesus died one time in history. But not everyone goes to heaven. Not everyone is forgiven. God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all, but not everyone appropriates that. Why? Because we have to receive Christ. He has to become ours. We have to transfer our trust from what we do to gain brownie points and hopefully sneak into heaven. We have to stop that foolishness and say, no, I'm going to trust on what Jesus Christ did on the cross on my behalf. That is what I plead. That is what I count on to get to heaven. It's not what we can do, it's what Jesus did. And uh, again, Isaiah 53, verse 6. I, I think it was Ironside who put it like this. We need to go in at the first all and come out at the last all. The verse starts with all and it ends with all. What does that mean? Go in at the first all. All of us need to recognize that we are a sinner that is strayed from God, that is hopeless and helpless and lost and has no chance to escape the judgment of God. That's us, the first all. But we can go out on the last all when we put our trust in the fact that God laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of every one of us. So have you done that? God wants us to come to Christ. Have you done that? Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the Bible, and we thank you for the word that was made flesh. Lord, our tiny minds can't really fathom God the Creator coming to earth and take on the helplessness of a created being. He wasn't created, but he took on all the frailties of human flesh, except sin. Had to learn to walk, talk, was tired, was hungry, took all the things that we experience, rejected, loneliness, misunderstood, all those things he took on so that he could die. And Lord, we, we thank you for your grace. Uh, we thank you for the sufficiency of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And Lord, I thank you that you know hearts. I, I pray that if there are any here that are trusting in their own way to get to heaven, that they, are, that they would realize that they're rejecting the very love gift that you gave to the world. Uh, they're rejecting that. They're rejecting you. They're rejecting your way. They're rejecting forgiveness. And I pray that you would impress upon them the danger that that puts them in. And Lord, I know many 
you're our Savior. And help us just to love you and rejoice in what you did for us during this Christmas season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a moment, Art and Don are going to come, but just to, a couple of things. What would God have us do? Uh, first, I, I think, does your belief about Jesus match the Bible? Jesus was and is and has been and always will be God. He has no earthly equal. No earthly equal. His mother, Mary, was blessed among women, but she was not divine. She was not holy. She was not equal to Jesus or just a little bit below Jesus. She is just like us. She was just like us, a sinner that needed to be saved. She was blessed with the privilege of carrying the Christ child, but that's all she was, chosen. Second, have you come to Christ for forgiveness? That's the most important thing. He came to earth to do that, to die for our sins. But again, just knowing about it, kind of like, you know, I've used this before, uh, Having a gift under the Christmas tree that you leave unopened and you take down the Christmas tree and it's still there unopened and you put it in the closet and you leave it there forever, it is a gift for you, but it never becomes yours until you take it for you and receive it for yourself. And we need to receive Christ for ourselves. And one other thing I think we should consider, and that's this, and this one might sound a little bit odd, but don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, you know, people would have looked at Jesus and said, that's God in the flesh? Yes, it was God in the flesh. And so we need to be careful at how we look at people. Art and Don are going to come and invite you to stand if you can. 440, Jesus calls us. 440, please stand if you can.